Hi, I'm Professor Michelle Barber. Welcome to the Enterprise Sessions. Today, I'm speaking with Tom Carter, who is CEO and co-founder of Ultraleap. Tom, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. So, uh, tell me a bit about your company, Ultraleap. So, Ultraleap, we are a tech company that removes the boundaries between the humans and the content, between the, the virtual and the, and the physical. So, we believe that the world is going to evolve so that just as today, I can assume that you've got a smartphone somewhere about your person. In the future, you'll be able to assume that everybody's got some form of augmented vision, some way of being able to see virtual content in 3D in and, in and amongst the real physical objects around you. And just as Hollywood has shown us with movies, you start off being able to say, that's computer graphics, that's real, that's computer graphics, that's real. We think that exactly the same trend will happen where soon enough everything looks realistic. You can't tell with your eyes what's real and what's virtual. And in that world, you're not going to interact by picking up the physical things with your hands and then clicking at virtual things with controllers or, or, or keyboards and mice. You're going to want to use your hands in both worlds. So that's what we do. We have hand tracking technology that uses a camera to take images of your hands and turn them into real-time 3D models with accuracy of a couple of millimeters on every bone and joint position in your hands. And then we also have a technology which we call mid-air haptics. And this projects the sense of touch through the air and onto your hands. So not only can the computer see what you're doing, but also you can feel some form of feedback. You can feel what you're doing uh, as you explore in this, in this fusion world with real and virtual stuff. What was the genesis of this technology? Where did it come from? So I started focused on the, the haptic technology. Uh, and this was at university. So in our student flat, we had a, a Microsoft Connect, one of these cameras for the Xbox. It's the first time you'd been able to control a computer really by jumping up and down in the air without physically touching anything. So it was amazing. And in the student flat, all the, everybody jumping up and down, doing the, doing the games, very, very exciting. And then they'd get to the, the menu screen where there would just be two buttons on the screen. And in order to press one of the buttons, they'd make these massive over-exaggerated movements because they didn't know where the button was. So the question there was, OK, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing it because they can control the computer by moving their arms, but they can't feel anything. So that was the idea of my, my undergraduate project and the end of my computer science degree was how can we bring back the sense of touch to that place? And we wanted to do it without wearing gloves or attachments. We wanted you to be free to move in and out of these sort of experiences. So that's what I tried to build. Built that for my, my undergraduate research project. Then I enrolled to do a PhD, used the PhD to get the technology really working and ready and, and spin the company out of the university and set up Ultraleap. It's quite unusual, I think, for um, a, a postgraduate student to, to come wanting to do a PhD with a fully formed project in their minds. But it sounds like you came to say, I want to be a PhD student and here's the PhD. I, I was very fortunate in this sense that my supervisor for the undergrad project was an adventurous type uh, who was excited by the idea of trying to build a technology to form a company rather than just purely for the, for the, for the research angle. It sounds like you started the project with a view to forming a company. In the course of doing that project, I also did an enterprise module. And the, the, the culmination of that is writing a business plan on my research project and then pitching it in like a Dragon's Den style set up and that's what made me think okay how do I turn this into a company and fortunately that's what my my supervisor Sri really bought into and uh, and that's how I ended up doing the PhD. So what other forms of support did you find you needed where was your where did your experience not equip you and where did you find that support? Well I mean being honest I had I had zero experience of running a company <laughs> I'd done two enterprise modules at university and I'd watched The Apprentice on TV and that was that, 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 that was about the sum of it luckily there's a whole bunch of support at, at the university so I started talking to the tech transfer team they actually helped setting up the company when we when we got to that point but they they helped with refining the business plan as well they made an introduction to an investor who ended up being our first investor in the company and then there's the new enterprise competition I was fortunate enough to win and that prize money is literally what funded the company, getting it out of the university, because we, we felt like we needed to become a company and, and, and establish before raising that first bit of money, because we needed to engage with customers as a real company. And then last, but certainly not least, was when we did start the company, we moved into SetSquared, mm -hmm. the, the, the incubator. And 
there's just a ton of support assets where it is entirely designed for people who have no idea what they're doing trying to build <laughs> companies and they have experts from all different fields they have financial advisors they have lawyers they have sort of mentors who've been there done this before uh, and then of course a big cohort of peers who are also there building companies every day who you can chat to over over the coffee machine that gives you that transition from being in an academic environment doing the phd to a to a commercial environment to a startup environment and sort of shifts the mindset and changes the focus. So You need some really tangible support. You mentioned like finance, HR, legal and so on. But then there's the more intangible sort of environment, that culture, that, that peer network. And I think they're both crucial in my view. I think the truth is nobody has all the answers. And even you look at the, the most successful founders in the world, the Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos, they don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. They can't come in and tell you what the answer is for your company. And the way you figure that out is you talk to numerous different people who have expertise or experience you get their input you never do exactly what they say but you kind of filter the different inputs together process them and chew on them and go okay right given that plus what i know about the company and the technology or the customers and what i've seen i i think this is the the thing that's the right thing to do and you kind of pick your own path tell me was that first business plan the cliche is the first thing you do with your business plan is you rip it up like <laughs> did it work out the way you planned we've changed direction a whole number of times yes. um we started off fully focused on the haptics technology part way through the journey we realized that the only way we can make you feel a button click is if we know where your finger is and we know when you press the button so we need to know where the hand is so there needs to be some kind of technology tracking the hands and then that actually le led to us acquiring a uh, Silicon Valley based company mm -hmm. who is the leader in hand tracking in the world bought them in-house and then the whole company's changed since then there's the um, there's the famous quote was it no plan survives contact with the enemy but I think mm -hmm. the better one is is Mike Tyson's quote which is everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face and <laughs> <laughs> definitely running startups means you're gonna get punched in the face a few times and you, you've got to adapt your plan so as a small company as a startup you're easy to ignore no one's heard of you in the first instance so how did you recruit those customers and, and, and partners in the first sort of phase? I have a two-step strategy. Mm -hmm. So step one, figure out what value you offer them. And then step two, send them an email. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really was that simple. So we spun the company out in November 2013. And then the first thing we did was book tickets to go to Las Vegas, because that's obviously what you do when you start a company. <laughs> But there's the, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas every January. It's the biggest consumer electronics show. The whole industry is there, all the tech companies, everybody's there. So it's a great opportunity to go and meet lots of people. And I emailed 13, 14 CEOs, founders of some of the biggest companies in the world. And all but one of them turned up for a meeting. Either, maybe not themselves, but they'd send a team. Uh, they responded, they came. The problem, the challenges that that created was me stood there in a hotel room in Las Vegas on the phone to a team from Apple who were coming to visit us with them saying, oh yeah, we're, we're running a bit late. Can you send your limousine to pick us up? <laughs> we, we don't have a limousine. Which, which limousine would you like? The red one or the blue one? Yeah, so. <laughs> the word exhilarating is what comes into my mind. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but was it exhilarating? Was it terrifying? Was it? Yeah. It was, what was it, what was it like? The most fun I'd had in, in, a, in a long time because we had a, like a little suite. The other two co-founders, Shri and Ben, slept in two of the bedrooms. I slept on the sofa bed in the main room and then would wake up every morning, pack everything away and then set the room up for a meeting. Yeah, it was, it, it, it was amazing fun and, and, and a real buzz doing something completely different and then getting that initial feedback. The, the other problem that, that the CES show created for us, other than not having a limousine, was we also didn't have any products. So we had a demonstrator. We bought enough boards to create three demonstrators. We were building it until one in the morning, routinely in the week, trying to get it to work. We fried two of the boards so they died. So we had literally the only one that in the world that worked. The glue to the little case that we put in dried in the overhead locker above my head on the flight out there. And then the demo worked for the first time 45 minutes before the first meeting. And then every single person we talked to said, this is great, can I get a few from my team back in the office? And we were like, Actually, not today, yeah. <laughs> but soon enough, we'll get you one or let you know. But it, it, it was exactly that. I think sometimes you can, you actually just stop yourself from reaching out to people under the assumption that, you know, you'll waste their time or they're, they're too important for you or something like that. The reality is people running companies, this is, this is what they need. They need to hear about good ideas. They need to hear about new opportunities. They need to filter them in. And then they've got teams of people who they know is the right people to push them to. 
that you can email a few people near the top of the company and invariably they'll either not respond because they don't see it, fine, you have, you've lost nothing. They'll say no or they'll pass it on to the, the best people and there's, there's, there's no, no negative to doing that. Does that come naturally to you or is that something you had to kind of talk yourself into? No, <laughs> that does not come naturally. That, that was definitely, yeah, sort of psych yourself up for it. Yeah. That, that's, that's the reason why I say send an email because you send the email, if you never hear from them again, I'm, I'm probably not going to bump into them at Tesco and be slightly embarrassed or have an awkward situation. So I, I kind of feel like that's a safe one. Walking up to them in person, yeah, far harder. I, I've still not, <laughs> still not mastered that one. Your company's at least partially investment backed, isn't it? Yes, yeah. So what's your experience been like? How do you find the, the right investors for the stage of development? How's that been for you? Yeah, so investment is really about three things, I would say. One is money, right? That's sort of the obvious one. Two is connections, the ability to open doors, pass on experience, link you with other founders, open the doors at customers, these kind of things. So investors are often very well networked by, the, by virtue of having a portfolio of companies and seeing what they're doing, what, who's doing what well. And then the third really is a, is a personal relationship, particularly at the early stage. If you're planning on building a company over the long haul, then the investors you bring on board near the beginning, you're probably going to be working with for a number of years. It's, it's really important not just to get the right fit in terms of you know, the right amount of money for the right deal terms, but also align the right in, the, the investor with the vision for the company. And then the third thing, that personal relationship, you have to be able to work together well, you have to be able to spend time with each other and you're going to go through difficult times. You're going to go through things where things aren't going well, where things look sketchy, where things look, it looks like you're not going to make it. And you know, you need to work together in those times and not make the situation worse. What's your main priority now? What are you trying to, what are you focused on now? And where do you see yourself as a company developing over the next couple of years? Two things, one is scale and two is continuing to develop the technology. And at the same time, what we can't do is just solely focus on that and end up being one of these companies that creates a thing and then just spends the rest of eternity polishing the thing. It's, we've got to push forward, we've got to get better. There's still so many super hard problems to solve and that's, I mean, that's kind of what keeps it interesting for me. So we've got, to, we've got to do both those things at the same time achieve scale with the customers while driving the technology forwards. So. There must be a lot of potential applications of your technology outside of the gaming world. So are there other spheres of life you'd like to see this applied in? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, ga gaming actually hasn't even come first. The thing that came faster was what I broadly classify as enterprise okay. categories. Mm -hmm. So people using our technology in the design process for new cars, for example. And then another big one is simulation and training. Mm -hmm. So Lufthansa, for example, use our tech to train all of the air crew on, on all of their flights through safety training. They put 20,000 people through training, they run it six hours a day. And the reason is you don't need to have a real physical plane cockpit for every different model of plane that you fly in. You can go into VR, you can be popped into whatever cockpit you're doing the training on today. You don't have controllers in your hands, so you can get on your hands and knees and look under the seats. You can put the tray table up, you can learn that sort of muscle memory. And then outside of virtual reality as, as well, we do a lot of work in the automotive space. Car companies want to pack more and more technology into the vehicle. They need an interface that can change form and function depending on what you're trying to do. So we enable you to pack more tech in, but have the feelings of buttons, whatever controls, feedback for gestures projected onto your hands. And then in the future, what are you gonna do in a car when it's fully autonomous and you don't own the car, they are operated in fleets and you press a button to get it. How are you gonna interact? What's that experience gonna be? And then the final thing at the moment really is what we call out of home. So entertainment end of the spectrum, theme parks, sort of stuff at Disneyland and this kind of stuff. And then on the functional side as well, we have a product that enables you to take public touchscreens and make them touchless. Mm -hmm. So if you're ordering your food at a fast food restaurant, getting your tickets at a train station, you can do that exactly as you would with a normal touchscreen, but without having to physically touch the screen so you don't spread germs and diseases and pathogens and all that kind of fun. From what you told me, this, this really started as an undergraduate and then moving into your PhD and you had a, a growing vision of what you wanted to achieve. What would you now say to young Tom? I think the most important thing to succeed on this kind of journey is to keep learning. Mm -hmm. When you're just, when you're at the beginning of your journey, when you're just starting out, the, the thing that you really got to do is you've got to find a way of compensating for your lack of experience. Talk to people, 
get their inputs, ask questions. I certainly did not ask enough questions at the beginning. This sort of feeling that I was the, I was supposed to be the expert on the technology, I was supposed to be the expert on this company, it gave me a feeling that every meeting or conversation I went into, I was supposed to be the one giving the answers. And that's sort of like hugely pressurizing and somewhat trapping and cuts off all of the learning because you don't get anything from other people, you're just giving all the time. So you've got to read books, listen to podcasts, absorb other people's experience, and then most of all, ask questions, talk to people. There isn't a point in your career where you can turn around and say you made it. There is no end, there is no finish line. It doesn't, until, even, even if you retire, there will always be more that you could do or, or could have done. And so the, the important thing is to kind of get comfortable with that and, and sort of build this mindset of really the game, the enjoyment is just to keep, keep learning, keep figuring out ways of doing things better, keep understanding things, and uh, that'll, that'll set you up very well. Do you find yourself now in a position to act as um, a, a mentor, at least a critical friends, to maybe undergrads, postgrads, looking at their own enterprise journey? Do you ever interact with that group and sort of give them the benefit of your journey? Yeah, absolutely. I've done that for years. Because I think you, you, can, you can be useful as a peer as you're going through the same journey. And then even if you've, if you, if, if you've founded a company and raised some investment, even just at that point, there's so much stuff that you've learned or figured out that you can pass on to, to, to people at a slightly earlier stage of their their journey. So I love talking to, to founders of companies coming out of the university or people thinking about starting companies. I'm very happy to get on the phone and uh, encourage people to jump. What are you most proud of? I think the culture, the people that we have at Ultraleap. I think we've done a, a tremendous job at collecting together a group of people who are not just incredibly smart, incredibly intelligent, and not just some of the brightest people in their respective fields, but also genuinely good human beings and enjoyable to spend time with. Creating that kind of atmosphere, I think, A, makes you happy, which is important in life, and B, sets the company up well for success. Tom, thank you so much for spending so much time speaking with me. Um, yours has been such an inspiring journey, but even with the amazing heights you've reached, it's really great for, for me and for our audience to understand where this came from and the little steps you took that led to such huge achievements. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been, it's been great fun. <laughs> great, thank you. If something we've spoken about today has piqued your interest and you think it might be relevant to your research, then please do feel free to contact us and enjoy the rest of the Enterprise sessions.